He is the apocalypse of the renewal of our life. I, I mean by that he's a revelation of what's supposed to happen to us if we're born again. If something, you know, whatever happens, our new life begins exactly where he has began by the direct inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm, I'm not preaching yet. I'm just thanking the Lord. I got a good voice, so I want to talk a little. You know. <laughs> but ours begin right where his did. You know, without regeneration, no person can be a Christian. Jesus made it emphatic. You must. You must be born again. When Nicodemus heard this, very religious man, it was great news to him, or at least news, but it, it, it was, he, couldn't, he just couldn't take a hold of that. It wasn't pleasing to him, nor was it possible to him. He said, how can I, 40 years old, re-enter my mother's womb? You know, it all was so far, far-fetched. Nor had ever been either the one or the other uh, to the world in general. You know, it's not been pleasing, nor has it been understandable. Too radical for the natural man or the Pharisee, the religious man, to take a hold of. Much easier, you know, to whitewash the outside, just kind of polish up the outside, uh, make it clean the platter, but do not want to touch the extortion and excess, the dead men bones on the inside. There's nothing so revolutionary, nothing does such violence to human nature as being born again. Nothing so radical as a man being born again. You're talking about his father-in-law here. All his life had been a drunk, but all of a sudden all he wants to do is pray. Had one well, over a period of 10 years coming to that, I mean, he met Christ, and all of that become the reality of life. It is truly a revolutionary thing to meet Christ. You, you know about him all your life, but to meet him personally, come in contact with this one. Well, we've been talking about him all week, and I, I want to, in this final morning service, I want to talk about a consecration to him. You know, in the school, we have one of the lessons uh, on, on, an, on consecration. And I, I'm going a little different, but in that one, I dealt with what a consecration was. You know, we dealt with the fact it's a renewal, a rebirth of spiritual hunger. That when a person comes back, what's happened to them? When they knew God and now that first love has cooled off, there's been a loss of spiritual desire. But a new consecration renews that spiritual hunger without which you can go nowhere from God because it's only those that hunger and thirst after righteousness that are filled with righteousness. He doesn't come to the, to the lazy, the indifferent, the non-hunger. There's something wrong with you. You're sick if you don't have an appetite. And so a new consecration always renews that. It puts the emphasis back on the spiritual. It puts forefront the new creation, the only one that God will deal with. It opens up the channel where the river can flow, and everything is in the river. Brother Woods and I, preaching a little on that last night while all this shouting is going on, or at least, brother, here, I got your name wrong. No, I did. It's all right. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> brother Woods is over here on the left. Amen. But anyway, we were talking about everything being in this river. I mentioned, yes, David. He's got a giant to kill. He went straight to the river, right to the brook. He knew where it was. We don't today. Pentecost knocks on the door of the world. They figure up some way to entertain them to get them in. But Pentecost is the river. He went back to that river. In there, he said, there's a giant killing rock in there somewhere. And if I probe around, I'll find it. I'll find the answer in this river. And it's always that way. Always that way. You, you and I have to believe that this is the answer. 
I noticed last night, my friend over there seeking, it is in his hand, that hand just going like that. He didn't know it. I said, he did let it take that tongue, same way it took that hand. It's just a matter of yielding to him and knowing when he's come, he does the work. He'll do the work. But there has to be now, we talked about Jesus, but a, a consecration to him that is total. Not to things, not to what he wants you to do. That all comes with a commitment and consecration to God. Many people consecrate themselves to what they believe God wants them to do. Then in a couple of three weeks, if it hadn't been done, then they go to looking for a Hagar to help God out with, then the whole thing is cursed. But if the commitment is to God, then the will of God comes with that. And so I want to read from Matthew this morning, chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, and we'll begin reading with verse 14. Chapter 14, verse 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. And Jesus said to them, They need not depart. Give you them to eat. And they said unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, bring them to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, took the five loaves and two fishes. Looking upward, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled and they took up of the fragments that remained, twelve baskets full. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. What a story. A little boy's lunch, feeding 5,000 men, probably 20,000 people there. They, they didn't abort babies them days. They went ahead and had them. And here the whole family are out there, and, and probably 20,000 people. And with one boy's lunch, he fed all of them and had a hundred times more left than what he started with. You know, Brother uh, J.C. Hibbert is one of the great men that I ever knew. Of all the people that influenced my life, he as much as anybody. He used to preach for me and I for him. And one year, preaching the camp meeting, we had one like this every year in Beaumont only. We had campgrounds out where we had them. And in that camp meeting that year, he preached on this message. And the other lesson where Christ broke the bread had, had more to break, but he had less when he got through than he did here. And what his whole message of faith was, the more difficult it is, the easier it is for God. Said he can take a boy's lunch, feed two, twice as many people, have twice as much left as he did in the other miracle when he fed just, just that other group. But his whole dealing was that if you come to God in total despair of a situation, then everything works out for that. Now, you know, a great multitude, that when the Bible never exaggerates, preachers do, we sometimes, you know, we get carried away and make the thing bigger than we did, ought to be, and you have to come back and recount that. I, I, I read one time a preacher, young preacher preaching, and everything got bigger as he preached, and his pastor told him, said, now you, you've got to quit that. You've got to cut that down. He said, I know, but said, you know, get so excited and said, God, big as he is, always make it bigger. He said, now I'm going to be there right in front of you. And said, when I see you get out of bounds, I'm going to say, taper, son. And he was up there and he said, and I was preaching and said that auditorium was over a hundred feet wide. He said, taper, son, and two foot long. (laughs) 
sometimes. <laughs> but when this Bible said there was a great multitude, that means there's a lot of people there. A lot of people. So great the disciples decided that it's absolutely impossible to feed them, yet the multitude was in real need, and the need was immediate. It must be met at once or not at all. I believe that's where we are in the world we live in. Tonight in that service, we're going to give an altar call for this world. That's what's going to ha happen here tonight. And I believe the need is beyond our ability to imagine, but it's immediate. We cannot send them away. I, I'm just as sure that the scripture in the book of Revelation where he said the harvest of the earth is ripe applies to the day in which we live. They come to the harvest everywhere you look, multiplied millions in the Hinduism of the new age, everywhere across this. The occults are just blossoming and blooming because man is open to be reaped. But you know, we're not there. Up and down my street, here comes those Mormons on a bicycle. When the towers fell, they're out there knocking on church doors. They want to know, come to Brother Jonathan here. Said, we'd like to come sing with you. Get together. Why, the devil took that, said, we can all get together here. You know, but there they are. I've been met in airports by Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, but have yet to be met by a Pentecoster. That's the truth. And I've lived on airplanes for 40 years. Amen. But the harvest of the earth is ripe, and it's being reaped. But like this, it's night coming. There's a need here. It's a great need, and it's now. It has to be met at this moment. Notice that in these circumstances, the, pr the presence of the disciples alone was not enough. Not enough just to go to church, have a little Bible study. Christ has got to be there. Not enough. You cannot meet the need of the people, no matter what it is, unless Christ is there. Unless it truly becomes a house of prayer with people dedicated to God, then we're just going going through the rituals of religion and turning people away from it. My wife and I had only been married a little while. When she was 14 years old, she was saved in a Baptist youth encampment. But she lives so far back in the woods. She never got to go to church, never got to go, but she never forgot what happened to her in that. So she said to me, I want us to go to church. Well, I wasn't church going people, but I went with her, went there that morning. I've never said the same thing. It is dry as dust, pale as a corpse. I mean, they went through rituals. I just myself, I said, this is nothing. I sat there, you know, I'm not being facetious but wished I had a beer the whole time the thing was going on. I mean, it just was out of way. And when he got through, he said, I want Brother Kelly here, one of our deacons, dismiss it. Well, I work with that joker. He not only drank, he run around on his wife. I said, religion, that's just not for me. Now, I'm not interested in that. When we have church like that, we win nobody. We turn the real away from it. Who wants that kind of a thing? If God is not there, I would not walk across that street to go to church just to have some place to go, but I'd crawl from Texas to be here in what's going on this week. I'd crawl across that, uh, that desert out there to be where Christ is. This is the thing. If it had only been the disciples out there, it's a hopeless situation. Absolutely nothing could be done. They could have had pity on that multitude and said some of them are going to faint in the way. There's some of them not well. Maybe some diabetics out there and they have to have food and there's no food here. But that would have still sent them away hungry. There would have been nothing. He said no use you tell a man that's cold to go and be warm. Put a cold on the man. But if you don't have any food, you can't feed them. There's no way men can take a fish sandwich and feed 5,000 men. Impossible. So without him being there. But Jesus was there and his presence was sufficient for every need. If we could just know that one more time, that 
his presence. Whatever you have to do to attract that attention, to get him there. If he's there, then everybody sick can be healed if they'll lay hold of it. The lost can be saved. The hungry can be filled if Christ is in that place. The disciples were both reproved and instructed. Jesus was there. His presence was sufficient. All were filled, fed, and satisfied. Everything. They were strengthened, and the disciples were rebuked without him saying one word. When Jesus uh, came to that feast, said there in the in the seventh chapter uh, of the book of John, I believe it is seventh chapter of the book of John, beginning with that verse thirty-seven. He came to the feast, that great day of the feast. It's been going on now, it's seven days, the eighth day uh, convocation. But he's there every day. Every day they were there, they poured water on that altar, had all them candles up there. But tradition says when they came on that eighth day, it's a waterless day. They don't pour water, and he was standing on that altar, Christ was. And he, what he said to them literally was, I am everything that water represents. I am the light. Amen. And he said, if you believe on me, as the scripture said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. You know, Christ being who he was, and if we are like him, we ought to be able to di discern also. He looked at that mob, ultimately saw everything about him. When he looked at him, they come here for a religious feast, and he looks and sees the heart in their eye. There's nothing. They're going to leave here without anything. He looked at it, and he said, it don't have to be that way. Out of your belly can flow rivers of living water. It's meant to be that way. But if we have church... What we call church without his presence, then we're going to send them away from the feast, haunted, wondering why God didn't do something in their lives. He didn't do anything because he wasn't there. He doesn't inhabit our religious customs. He inhabits our prayers and our praise and our worship to him, our consecration to Christ that we come here to meet him where two or three are gathered in my name. That's not just coming here and say, I come in the name of Jesus. That means we're here in the very character of the Lord Jesus Christ, here in the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. I didn't just come here. Simeon went into that temple in the spirit and he met Christ there it is there when we come in the name of Jesus in the very character of that Christ now the multitude now the smallness of the supply presented any difficulty to Jesus there's a great crowd maybe 20,000 there's a there's all the food he can hold in his hand, but that presented no problem. He never batted an eye at the crowd, said, my, we've got a big job before us today. He never looked at that. What am I supposed to do with this? There was no problem. When the disciples placed all they possessed at his disposal, Jesus said, it's enough. I can tell you tonight in that service, if you and I will lay all we have at his disposal, it'll be more than enough. He can take that and multiply it. But you know, when we just, when we don't give it all, then you have to come back again. One boy gave it all. Everybody is fed. He never said, I'll give him half of this, two of these fish. He just give it all to him and it become enough. It's always that way. The f those first disciples were very, very much like ourselves. This is a very comforting thing in many ways, uh, not that you commend unbelief, but it's good to know the same was in them as in me. They had the same problems we do. Had to overcome their pride, had to overcome their desire to be the biggest, the chief. He said, if you want to be chief, then you got to be like me. Wash the rest of these folks' feet. Amen. Be, be the servant to everybody. But 
they were very, very much like we are. They had little faith. He constantly rebuked them for not having any faith, but he never threw them away. You see, don't be discouraged. Just because you didn't raise the dead yesterday, hang on, keep believing. He does all the raising. That's the only reason the dead didn't get up is too much of you still there. He's still working on you. And if we let him, they had a little faith, easily appalled and discouraged. I mean, they're ready to quit just all along the way. They were slow to learn, had a little faith. Jesus never scolded nor despised them. Never. He in love led them on and used them to change a world. That's always been an encouragement to me. He showed himself so truly one with them that he would do nothing without them. He would do nothing without them. That is, that is, that really is wonderful and frightening. Because if the church is dead, Chino believes God is dead. That's all it is to it. We are his body. We're his representation. When they come sit down among us, then they're going to leave here believing that this is the way God is. And if God, if the church is dead, God is dead as far as a world is concerned. Can we believe that the same Jesus that walked this earth, now seated on the right hand of the Father, is so one with us in this 21st century that he'll absolutely do nothing without us. If my people will, I will. It's always there. If they won't, I won't. In the book of Ezekiel, there in chapter 36, you have God dealing with them, telling them, and in one line of those scriptures from about... Uh, verse 20, I don't know, down through that chapter, uh, he, he carries on. He, he goes on 15 times. He uses the word, I will, I will, I will. I'll give you a new heart. I'll do this. I will do that. And on and on. Now, you'd think that would be enough. Uh, I mean, just the fact that he willed. But then it didn't happen. But verse 36 tells us why. It said, I've never once been inquired of you. Never once did you lay hold of me about it. Never once did you come and seek me for it. He will do nothing without the cooperation of his body. We have to be involved with him if we're going to see that dedication to him, not not to anything but him, not to some religious organization, but to Christ, to know what he wants, and then that's all that's necessary. He wanted to feed these multitudes. He don't want to send them away. We have other plans. He don't have those plans. We must know that and be dedicated unto that. Now, can we believe that he, the true vine, will bear no fruit save he bears it through us, his branches? You know, if we remain in that vine, there's no union like a branch and a vine. There's nothing. Whatever's in the vine is in that branch. If there's joy in that branch, in that vine, then that same joy will be in that branch, and the people we minister to will receive that. But there has to be that connection and that dedication to him that we come here only to worship him. I told you, I'm preaching when the first got started, and in the night service, I didn't know what happened to me, but I ruptured my side, just tore it. Uh, lose. I never went through such agony. The next day, I fought all day. I knew I couldn't preach in the awful condition I was in. But there's an old man come to those meetings every night. He was 80 years old. Every time he come, he either brought me a pair of socks. I mean, always white socks, you know. They look good with a black suit. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Always bought me a pair of socks or a handkerchief. I said, you know, brother, I've got all the socks I can wear. He said, God told me you're a prophet. That's what he said. I've never said that he said it. And he said, I, he brought it every night. Well, that night I went out to that church. I knew it's, I, I just barely walk over there. I've got to hold myself together. And I said, I, I, I cannot preach. But he came. And I told him, I said, I'm not be able to preach tonight. He said, oh, God must heal you. And we went in a little Sunday school room, and I started to pray. Now, oh, hold it now. Hold it now. He said, now, if you, we've got to first get his attention. 
For we ask him, and that was his words, old gentleman, 80 years old. That sound old then, don't sound very old now. <laughs> he said, he said, we got to get his attention. I said, how do we do that? He said, now, you know, if a man walking down that street in front of this church and you wanted him, Brother Down's coming, I'd say, sir, I'd like to borrow a quarter off of you. He said, you wouldn't do that. You'd first get his attention, could have speak to you, sir. You got to get his attention before you make any demands on him. How do we do that? He said, you, you praise him. You pray, you worship him. So got down, got to praise and worship him, really got caught up. Heard the old Sunday school door close and open. I said, he left me. I, I didn't look. I just heard the door open, close. <laughs> I thought he left. Now, to this day, I don't know who opened or closed, whether the old man just opened it and decided he wouldn't leave and closed it back or not. But I know right after it opened and closed, he put his hand on my head and something sewed my side up, and I've been preaching for 48 years. You see, you've got to get him. Healing's not you. You can lay hands on them. The apostles run up against the devil they couldn't cast out because they left the altar. They never kept that consecration that he was all in all and knowing if he don't come, it's no need in praying for anybody. If he don't show up here, there's not anything worthwhile, nothing to take home with you. Nothing is going to be here. Imagine, if we can believe this, then we've come a long way in reproducing Pentecost, that he'll do nothing without us. Now, if we can know, dwell on such thoughts, how could we without our hearts? really burning within us that he'll do nothing without me but if i'll let him he'll do everything through me he broke that bread but they gave that bread away they're the ones he has to be the one but somebody has to give it away i'm the bread of life but i am broke for you but i have to be distributed through you but i will not be through unconsecrated hands and hearts he that hath clean hands and a pure heart gets this blessing nobody else I'm just telling you that we need in this altar to make that dedication that commitment absolute and make sure we make it to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ can we believe that the same love, same power that loved and worked through Jesus desires to love and work through such pure, unworthy instruments as said in this room this morning. Can we believe that? That he wants to do that, but that vessel has to be his and his alone. He will not share his life with your life. He's not going to come in here and share his life. Two people with two different wills cannot get along in the same house. This won't work. you got to bring that, even that marriage. The Bible said better to be on a roof than in a big house with a woman screaming at you. And I'm sure he could have said it the other way around. It's better to live on the roof than in the house with a man that's carrying on. you got to get them wheels together. Amen. And with God in his Christ, then there has to be this life is his life. There's no place for me in this. Can you believe without presenting your body afresh to him? Can you believe what I've just told you without you and I in this altar this morning presenting that body anew and afresh as a living sacrifice? Whatever you want with it, wherever you want to send me, just reveal your son which is your will through me. Can we believe that? To be filled and taught by the Holy Spirit and to be at any cost to be used for him for the fulfillment, not of my will, but his will be done. Now, if God in this last morning could just all that we've talked about, prayed about, and sing about this week could be brought into this altar and before God unpretending say to him, I present 
present this body a living sacrifice. I will never defile this body. I give it to you to be, to be used to reveal your son, whatever you want out of me. I will go where you want me to go. I will say what, I will give what you want me to give. This has to be the thing that takes a hold of it. Christ pleads for full consecration of all we have and are to him who has given himself without any reservation to us. He held nothing back. Just to come down to this dirty world is more than I can imagine. God, who cannot even look on sin, when he took my sin, his own son took my sin, then God turned his back. The whole world turned dark. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now that moment was the worst moment. All along that line, walking toward Calvary, he knew that's the cross. Those nail prints. He'll die. He knew that. That'll, that'll be an agony for a while, but I will die. I will die. That'll be over with. But think he's going to turn his back on me because I took your sins. That was the agony. That's what he prayed in Gethsemane. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But if there's no other way, I'm given to your will. That's a consecration. Gethsemane comes from two words. It means a place of crushing. That's what uh, geth means, a place of, but simon, that comes from the same word of seed, simon, the same, the place of crushing. Life flows at crushing where he, you, if you think that he went from the streets of Jerusalem to Calvary, you're wrong. He went from Gethsemane where he agonized over or what he had to do. I'm telling you, it'll cost no less. We don't have to go to a cross to die for a world, but we have to die. Yes. That's what consecration means. Not my will, but thine be done. Ask yourself, am I in that kind of a relationship with Christ? As I, I, as, am I before him in the consecration to him as he was to the Father? He made it very plain. In, in, to be in him was exactly the same as what it was to, for him to be in the Father. He said that. He taught us that. And he said, I have no words of my own, have no works of my own, have no will of my own, I seek no glory of my own. That's what constitutes him being in the Father. And when you and I come to that kind of a consecration, then we'll see the same glory of God being manifested as certainly not in the way of the full extent it was through him, but we'll see it working. I didn't say strong faith. I said an unreserved consecration. I didn't say be before him with profound intelligence. I said an unreserved consecration. I didn't say extraordinary spiritual attainments and gifts. I said, are we before him in an unreserved consecration? Have I laid myself on that altar and said to him, whatever you want out of me, I'm here for that. Whatever it takes, no matter what men think, women think, who thinks? I'm here only for this. I say an unreserved consecration. We didn't know what it may mean. I have no idea. I didn't have no idea when I quit that job began to preach that I'd be here today or that I'd be living in Russia or that I'd spend seven years in Vietnam. I didn't know what that would take. But I can tell you this, if I knew what consecration uh, to him, uh, that I know what it is now, I don't know where he would have took me. I can tell you. I've had a little bit of his blessings on my life. But if I knew what I'm telling you, you young men, and you hear preachers with a life before you. If you lay it on the line, you don't know where it'll take you. You just say where he goes, I'll go. Like Ruth, I'm going to serve your God. Your family's my family. It doesn't matter. I'm not going back to the Moabs. I'm here, yours, and you don't know where it'll take you. Amen. Oh, but it'll take you, and it'll take you wonderfully. He knows that's enough. 
I don't know what it may involve. You don't have to know. He knows and that's enough. You cannot love ourselves as he loves me. I can't care for myself as he cares for me. No matter where he sends me, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you there. The one thing needed is for us to take Jesus as our master and Lord, that despot, absolute master. That's what it is. Amen. That I come unto that. Everybody needs to know that. Everybody connected with us needs to know that. When Mr. Wigglesworth, I, I, I had a man that he lived in his home told me this story. His wife died. He's across town. She preached. He preached. She is so real to him. She led him to Christ. He couldn't read at 36 years old. She taught him. And now she died. And they laying on that platform. When he got there, it, it's, she'd been dead for maybe a half an hour. And he got down. He began to rebuke that death as he cried out, here's a woman that's been everything in his life. And as he rebuked that death, she come back for one moment and said, not this time, Smith, and went on. And as he lay there weeping, God said, she had too much of your affection, son. You got to be careful. You may love him too much. You better not give him what belongs to him said, I want that. I want that. And they said his ministry quadrupled. What a price to pay. Keep each other in the right place. You love your wife more if you love him more than you do her. You love that husband more if you love Jesus. But he said, I'm not second place to nobody in your life. I'm number one. If your wife won't go, you go anyway. If your husband won't go, you go anyway. You are mine. And that's the consecration that he wants out of us. The one thing needs us to take him as master and Lord with the unreserved consecration. Give him ourselves, possessions, loved ones, everything we have. Give it to him. Lay it at that cross. You know, when I, my, my family, that preacher said they had diphtheria. I don't know. I just know we woke up Monday morning. My wife's mouth is, is as white as a shirt all the way down her throat. Fever so high, she just come and went. By noon, both of my children were in the same thing. All over, I put them all on one bed, had a little cot. They're just babies, one sleep head one way, one the other, in an old cheap motel holding a revival. And they come down with this. I prayed all day long, locked them in that motel, went to church that night. Preacher said he had a gift of healing, could feel it in his hand. And I told him, pray for my family. Well, we prayed there, but when church was over, I said, I want you to go to that hotel with me. He said, I'm too tired. I said, I I'm telling you, Pastor, they they're sick. They my wife is just coming coming going. I said, I prayed all day. Well, I'm too tired. Come in the morning. Well, I prayed all night long. He come the next morning, nine o'clock, when he come through that door, had one look at him, run out in the street. I said, come on in here. I'm not coming in there. They got diphtheria. I know what that is. He said, you better get a doctor. They're going to quarantine. I said, I've been trying to get that doctor. The only one I know, his name is Jesus. And you said, you got a gift to heal him. Come heal him. He drove away and left me. All day, I wrestled. I went to church that night. I preached. I, my message, our devil's real. I hadn't preached 20 minutes till there's 18 or 20 young people, teenagers like these fine young people come here from Colorado and here. They jumped up screaming, running that altar to be saved. When they gathered around to pray, I went out that door and on the way to that motel, I said to God, I said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm no better, no worse than anybody. You know, you don't have to do anything. I don't tell you what to do except one thing. If you're going to take them, that's your business. But you're going to tell me. I'm not going to leave that motel no more unless it drag me out violently till you tell me what you're going to do with my family. I got that just like I left them that when I went to church. I began to pray 10 o'clock at night. I began to pray. I, I said, I'll praise you while their soul go out that window. But you tell me what you're you're going to do. Well, it, I prayed started at 10, didn't know how long. If it, it, it Just neighbors were spared because there's a carport between me and them on both sides. But I just all of a sudden realized somebody's in this place. 
and I become frightened. You know, I can't see. I've never been afraid of much what I can see. It's the unseen. I, there's no closet in the place. How did it get in? And I sat there just kind of frightened. I felt a hand on my shoulder. And the voice said, go to bed, son. Everything is all right. It was 2 o'clock, four hours I'd been there. I lay down and died. Ain't slept in two days. Woke up at old cottage shaking. And the little old four-year-old boy said, Papa, I'm hungry. And here come a little three-year-old girl around the bed, said, we got anything to eat? Then a 22-year-old girl sat up and said, Daddy, I'm starving to death. The long night had passed. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. But he had to bring me to a place that I said, if you take them, I'll praise you while their soul leaves you. But I said, if you let them live, when I get to Chino, I'm going to tell them. Yes, sir. I'm going to tell them about this. Everywhere, tell them. All of them said, that dedication to him, family, houses, lands, nothing can be before him. Nothing. In return for all, for our all, he'll give him himself and his all. In return for that. The key to Pentecost is obedience, doing what he says. Mary says, whatever he tells you, do, just do it. Don't ask him questions. He tells you to fill up them pitchers with water. You're looking for wine, just fill them up with water. Amen. Because a man standing here that turns water into wine at the beginning of his ministry will raise his own self from the dead at the end of it. Don't worry about it. Just do what he tells you to do. Just give yourself to him. Die to all you are. Leave the resurrection to him. That's all he asked of me, and that's what faith is all about. Nowhere in the Bible you told to try to do anything. There's not one place in this book that God says, Pastor Duke, I want you to try to do this. No, no, never, no. There are many commandments that appear absolutely impossible to obey, but they're definite commandments. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. You saying that to me? Who else? Who else? I talk to individuals. God never talked to a crowd. Always talk to one man. Always talk to you. The brother said to me this morning, said, I couldn't sleep all night. He said, what you've been saying, I woke up. I couldn't sleep. He is everything. And I've had so many things that took away from that. But, oh, he said, it ain't going to be like that no more. Oh, no, no, there's nothing. We need to set ourselves not to try to obey this great God as far as we can. I'll do the best I can, uh, but just simply do what he tells us. That's all. Just do what he tells us. When you, you never get anywhere till you start. An old Chinese proverb says, a thousand mile journey starts with one step. You can't go nowhere. Another one of their uh, proverbs is you can't carve rotten wood. Amen. <laughs> Just won't work. But this all has to be a beginning. I give myself to him. I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm going to take it to the whole world because that's what he said to do. And you begin that journey. Now, this, this is a key. In this service here this morning, I believe we determine if we really, everybody, that really means business of God, would determine to obey the command of the Lord in every detail, we'd witness one of the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in California since it's used the street. If we could. It is us, nothing else. It is a warfare between what I want and what he wants. That's what Paul meant when he said flesh and blood. Warfare between flesh and spirit, rather. One is contrary to the other, and you cannot do what you would with such a thing going on. You cannot. But if we resolve that warfare, determine, I will do what you want me to do. Lillian Thrasher, the mother of that Nile that, that, that had already engaged to be married to a very fine young man. At that altar, God Almighty said to that young lady of about 20 years old, you'll go to Egypt and put that orphanage. She got up, her, her, her husband-to-be was sitting on that front seat. She told him, he said, you'll do it without me. You'll do it without me. Yeah, I, there'll be no wedding if you got any ideas like that. She said, there'll be no wedding. He gave her thousands of children.
I said, he gave her 1,000. I heard her at 85 years old give a testimony of how God took that woman, just a woman by herself, into that world of Islam and what God did with her. But she had cost her. It cost her. Here she's already got a wedding date set, got a dress bought and a ring on her finger. But God said to her, you're going to Egypt. He said, I'm not going. Well, you got to make up your mind now. It's a question of the flesh and spirit. Which is going to be the desire? Which is the strongest pull on your life? That's the dedication you have to make. What is the strongest will? God... God does not give his spirit to those who long for him. He gives that spirit to those that obey him. He doesn't give it because you cry and look pitiful. He gives it because you obey it. He gives it. He looks in that heart. This man, this woman will go where I want him to go. That's a commitment that I'm wanting out of him. He doesn't pass it out. A lad's lunch in the hand of Jesus can feed the thousand. Poverty in his hand is more riches than all this world put together. Poverty in his hand is an answer to everything. It isn't a matter. It isn't machinery. It isn't money we need. It's Jesus that we need. We're always thinking. Not a question of resources at all. Amen. If we'll obey and cease to reason, there'll be more than enough. Brother Darren and I talking this morning there about the expansion and how God's doing. He said, you know, it's wonderful how that God has supplied the need as we went. Don't need no need if you're not going. Don't need no bank accounts. If you're not going anywhere, why give you anything? It only comes as you move. In his light, there's light. In that light, there's everything. Because that light is life. There's money to do whatever he wants. If we just move into it, we're always waiting around till we get the resource. The resource is Christ. If I'm going to deliver the right commodity, then he will supply the need to get it there. One of the great miracles of this school. You know, they're in with 3,500 people on our mailing list. I could dismiss 1,500 of them and not lose a quarter. That's right. We, we're no big million people mailing list. There's a handful of people. I mean, this church and a handful of preachers that have carried this gospel to the world. I see organizations don't have 1,200 churches out there. I mean, whole organizations. But because it was a people willing to give what they had, that's always been the way it is. The supreme need of every work of God in this hour is a manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the need. You come where he's alive, everything else will take care of itself. There has been a measure of blessing among us, a few souls saved, a few baptized in the Holy Ghost. But where is that person that can chase a thousand and them two chase ten thousand? I'm just telling you, we haven't arrived. No matter what he's done, we're so far away from it. But there is held out that banner. You can cross this river, but it's going to cost you everything. You've been hanging on to part. You, you, you said, I'll give this and hang on. But it's when you lay it all down there. What, just, just shuffle through it. Whatever you want, walk off with it. It's in that point in time that everything begins to come back to us. There's been a measure of blessing. Where are the vessels from which the rivers of living water truly flow? Few of us are satisfied with the results of our labor. And the man that is has been lost a long time. The man that's satisfied with his labor. Young preacher told me, he said, you know, I, I, I've been preaching a couple of years. I'm still so nervous when I preach. I said, I've been preaching for 48. I sit on this front seat. I kept saying, they're going to hand this to me in a minute, and i got to get up there. Nervous. Amen. What am I going to do? Always. He said, you know, I, I look at my life. It seems I've done nothing. I said, if it ever changes, son, get you a job. Go on out there somewhere. If it ever changed, there is so much to be done. There'll never be a time on your life you think you've done anything, but you just keep plowing. Just keep going. Keep walking. There'll be a day. Amen. All of this. Few as us satisfied with our labor. Many think that if we just had better equipment, they'd do better. 
country. I hear that all the time. If I just had a car, if I just had this, if I bought all the cars that people want me to buy, I, I, I tell you, I'd have more cars than converts. That, you know, everybody wants something. You wish they could have it. It's so wonderful to have that piano and a lady to play it. Wonderful to have this worship team up here. Wonderful to have those guitar players. But I can tell you, God had come here from no, none of them here. You see, if we get to thinking we've got to have that, then that's what our faith is in. My faith is in that music to get them hyped up. I preached in Madisonville, Kentucky, and I had at that time the most popular singing group in this nation. They wanted me to come preach revival at a church. I went there to preach for them. Monday night started. When it got their house full of people, man got up and out and said, the singers won't be here tonight. Nearly half of them left, just walked out. I didn't bother me. Them goats, tares, just come around and be entertained anyway. So I didn't bother about that. I'm going to preach these people that are here. But nobody stayed. But they did leave the musicians. And the boy led to singing. He got up there and bucked, and snorted, and jumped, led to singing. That's wonderful if it's real, you know. But he proved it wasn't real because as soon as he got through, they left. Tuesday night, <clears throat> same thing. Singers didn't come. But all the musician, that song leader, as soon as they got through, they left. Wednesday night, I'm ready for that. I'm telling you, I'm standing right behind him. When he got through that last song, I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, I'm going to call him by name. I'm going to tell you something, sir. I don't need you to jack me up. I've been in that hotel all day seeking God. I come here ready to preach. And if you don't want to hear me preach, I don't want to hear you sing. Don't come back. Amen. He went over and sat down. All I'm telling you is what we need is Jesus. Whether you have anything, it's wonderful if you have the, all these assets. Wonderful to have a computer. Wonderful to have a car. Paul had none of that. But he evangelized the world of his day because he went in the presence of this Christ. He gave all. Christ gave him all. That is all anybody ever needed. Amen. We're saying if I just had the material, I'd be able to to do this but that is a need is the presence of the Holy Ghost if for the most part the people uh, we know and people we reach if they're not being one to Christ why win any more of them if they're not really being given over to Christ why win any more perhaps it's time to suspend a lot of operation get back in the altar and make the dedication to Christ again that he can come back we've centered our preaching on the wrong side of that message I've watched it now for 30 years. I've watched this thing as it moved along. And this pulpit, not this one here, but I'm talking about the church in general. There's always exceptions to rule. But the vast majority of that church has centered on the wrong message. It's concerned itself, first of all, with a message of faith. That's a gift of God. If that river flows, you don't have to preach about any faith. There'll be faith there. That's not something I conjure up, work up. The Bible said faith comes. That means it comes from God. Amen. It's a gift of God, according to Paul. In the book of Ephesians, he said, By grace are you saved, and that, that faith not of yourself. You get God in the place, the Holy Spirit moving, the river flowing. Faith is there. We preach gifts. They're sovereignly given by the Holy Ghost. All, every gift is in me this morning. Every gift is in the pastor. Every one of them. All nine are in the Holy Ghost. He can use anyone. His man always, always get this. What do you consider the best gift? What are you talking about? He said, covet the best gift. I said, the best gift is the one you need right there. Amen. Somebody dying, you need a miracle. You need faith. The best gift, then none of them are right above another one. Whatever you need, covet the best gift. We need God to come and to work. But we centered on, we preached all of this. Get God to move it. Blessings. Always given to the obedient. He said, you'll eat the fat of the land. You don't have to pray about obedience. You don't, you don't have. We centered all of this. I mean, we centered these blessings. Just be obedient to God. Blessings will come. He said, if you just bring your tithe.
by then. I'll open the windows of heaven upon you. That's God's. There's no need in preaching about a blessing. Just get people where God can bless them. All he wants to do. You know when you come to God in this altar this morning, you don't have to come here like an attorney with a 25-page script. Amen. All you've got to do and all God wants you to do is get in a place where he can be God to you. Obedient. We preach healing. Your health will spring forth. Let this river touch you. You're going to get well. That's just all it is. We, we preach joy. That's a fruit of the Spirit. What I'm saying, in a revival, all this comes. These things are natural fallout of a real Pentecostal revival. You don't have to preach like the glorified body. You don't have to pray for that. Make the rapture. He's got one prepared for you. Don't have to preach tongues. Get full of the Holy Ghost. He'll give you the language. This is always like the glory. Our preoccupation with these benefits have produced a curse of imitation. We preach those gifts and preach them. Now somebody says, I've got to function with them. I've got to operate them. And we produce that curse of imitation. But you know, nobody has rehearsed anything up in that upper room. They have no idea on this earth what's going to happen. They just know they're going to be filled, and we'll know when it happens. Nobody's going to be up here to ask, no counselor for me to go, what do you think happened to me? No, this is that, said the man of God when it come through. And all of the other things were working. I can tell you, Mary was jumping as high as everybody else up there. No matter what the Pope thinks, she received it exactly like everybody else else but there was no preconceived notion nobody had taught them jiggled their jaw said say coca-cola 25 times they just sat there when he come this come they obeyed and folks said they're drunk my dear brother russian brother told me last night said you know for saved I, he don't mind me telling you said for saved he used to drink said oh that wine did get me get me he said, oh, something got in me tonight. And he said, I feel the same things. That oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what they said on the day. He said, they drunk. He didn't say they wasn't drunk. He said, just not drunk like you think. Amen. They drunk on the Holy Ghost, and they plumb mad at that devil. I'm telling you, this thing's going to happen out here. But they're possessed. I said they're possessed of God. Hallelujah. In our lust for the benefits, we fail to preach the message that will produce a revival. In our lust for the benefits, we, we, we come. We just want some big manifestation. We want to be healed. But the way to get that, seek the kingdom of God. Seek his kingdom. The church has been filled with tares who are attracted by a message that promised everything but cost nothing. Cost nothing. Just come and get. They go to India. Let me tell you, my heart for India is burdened this morning. But they go, Miss the big German evangelist spent three million dollars. Three million dollars in a crusade. Had a million people or more out there in front of him. Amen. Promised them. Promised them healing. All of them are sick, folks. I said, all of them are sick, but you can't find a footprint when it's over. Nobody got up and said, those three billion gods of the Hindu is all false. There's only one God. You got to come here. You got to repent. You get right with him. He will heal your body. You press that home to that mind and they'll be born again. I can tell you, sick man, be a fool. Wouldn't go someplace to think they're healing. They're going down with arthritis, letting them put gold in their blood down there in Mexico. Mexico and doing nothing for the arthritis, but nothing else is either, and the thing is crippling him up. He's desperate. That isn't the way this works. Seek the kingdom of God. The benefits will always come. The message that produced revival is prayer. People are in hell because you and I fail to pray. He said, when Zion travails, they'll be born. If Zion don't travail, they won't be born. And I can tell you, we'll be reminded of that judgment seat. There's a lot of people in hell because you wouldn't do what I told you. We point our finger at a lot of folks that don't do anything, but yet the travailing spirit of the church being absent has caused many people 
to be lost that could have been saved. Repentance. Prayer leads to repentance, and repentance makes prayer effective. Amen. All along. Amen. Restitution. You never hear that anymore. All well, people leave the church, backslide, gone six months, come back in, lay that last week's tithe. No, no, there's six months of tithe and 20% on top of that that has to come in here. It has to come. You've done nothing. I didn't write the book. I'm just a newsboy putting it on your doorstep. I'm telling you, if you're going to get right with God and give him all, you've got to listen. If any part of it's not true, then none of it is true. You don't borrow this or steal it. When you come back, you do right. Pastor, I'm going to have to borrow the money, but I'm going to have to get this right. You're not going to come back and just pick up where you left off. It don't work that way. I said, don't work that way. If a righteous man turned from his righteousness, all of his righteousness forgotten, you may have won a thousand souls. It's over with. They won't be mentioned in heaven. You start over. But I'll tell you one thing. You don't just start over by saying, I'm going to pick up here. Now, you're going to pick up back there. You, the restitution is a reality. I know I was saved at 27 years old. There's no way I can correct all of that mess of my life. And he didn't intend for me to. Wherever I could, I, I, I did. But there's no way that I could go and correct. You know, in Russia, when we were there, they want every man to have to confess all of his sin. One old bishop with me about it, I said, that's not so, and taught in that school, so he come to correct me. And I said, you know something, sir? There was 3,000 men saved on the day of Pentecost. Now, Peter had to listen to those confessions. Man, he'd still be listening. Can you believe? I said, there's men out there 60 years old. Multiply 3,000 by an average of 40. How many years have you got? I said, he'd be still sitting over there listening to that confession. he got to confess he's a sinner, but now I'm not that now. I'm a Christian. If I wrong this church, if I murmur against this pastor, i got to go to that pastor. I mean restitution. If I've stole God's money, i got to bring it back in here. If a thief keeps the money, he hadn't repented. We wonder why. I said, we wonder why that revival tarries. But if we preach the right side of the message, and once, once we've done all this, and that river flows, all them other things, faith will be there. Blessings will be joy. Oh, my. A lady just told me the other night, said, I've never had such joy. I said, it always comes. Nobody has to preach. Now, you've got to be happy now. Put a smile on your face. That's the way the world does. You know, put a smile. Well, if you don't have a smile, how are you going to put it on? But if you're full as Holy Ghost, you've got to smile. <laughs> Joy comes with this Holy Ghost. <laughs> Blessed be the restitution. Confession. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God won't hear me. No need kneeling down there to pray. If I regard any restitution, he said, you got all against your brother? Just leave your gift on that altar. Now you go on, get right to your brother, and come back here, and you and I will settle up everything. But don't, don't talk to me no more. Don't, don't con me. Grandkids can do that, just grandparents. They, they, they can do things to you. You know, I, we were here years ago, four or five, and brother talking about his grandkids. said his kids at home, they'd jump on that bed, get on that bed, jump it up and down. Mama dust them off good, I'm telling you. But said, now that grandson, she said, look at that little old darn. said, he's clearing that bed 18 inches. <laughs> you know, but they, God doesn't have any grandkids. You know, he don't have it. He means you to get right. And when we do, he comes. I said, he comes. His blessings, restitution, restitution, confession. It's not our words, but the state of our being that gains the attention of God. Here is the man. That's a generic term. Doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Here is the man that I look to. He who is of a broken and a contrite spirit that trembles at my word. It is the man that woman whose, whose heart is right, who state of the bit, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous, that means a right man, avails much. It comes, the effectual praying. Souls are perishing now for the lack of God's power in the church. Men are going to hell. We need to ask God to search us this morning. We've been hearing 
I've been trying to preach with a voice that didn't want to work, but we, we're talking about this Christ being all and that we must not allow anything to separate us from him. And we come in here in this altar in a few minutes. We need to ask God to search us, remove all that hinders his power from flowing through us in a greater measure. Whatever is in us. You know, you get cholesterol clogged up, your arteries get short, then it restricts life. And it, when the blood's not flowing properly, life is restricted. And when there's things in your life that restrict the flow of the Holy Ghost, life is restricted. Less people be saved, less people be healed, less things will happen. You don't have to beg a river to flow. Blow up that dam. I mean, clear it out. That things are pushing against the walls, wanting to flow all the time. And if we just get rid of that, that hinders. Have we been tempted to murmur? Oh, goodness. We worry about what the Islam is doing out there. We worry about what the government, they don't bother us. Amen. And, you know, I, I marveled. Not one time, only time Paul ever mentioned Rome, he said, I'm a Roman citizen. That's all. Because the men going to beat him, not lawful do that. So he said, I'll get out of this beating anyway. I've been beaten enough. Amen. But never, never Jesus never said, now if we can get a better Caesar, this thing would work out. Never. He come with his own culture. He didn't come in here to reform the world through that. Our problem isn't out there, no matter what they do. They don't let our kids in our school. If I said, the devil wouldn't let your kids in there either. Amen. That's his place. The world hates us. Why do we think they're going to love us anymore? Only reason they love us because they get inside of us. The problem is that murmuring. Oh, the preacher ain't not doing like he ought to do. Don't like the way he preached. You ought to preach something on this. You ought to preach on that. All you're saying is he don't know God. I know him. Why ain't you a preacher then? Why ain't you got you up there? Why, why don't you a man come to me one night that been a message <clears throat> come forth in tongues? <clears throat> I mean, hair stand up on your head. You knew it's God. Little old lady interpreted, you knew it's God. He come down and said to me, he said, that wasn't the interpretation. I said, how do you know? He said, I had it. I said, well, that's, that's good. You, yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. You know, I just, you, you knew what you had there. <clears throat> What he ought to have said, you know, I was totally wrong. I thought I had that, but that woman give that. But no, he had come down. Let me know he had. Murmuring, you see, that spoke, you know, spoke unkindly of a brother or a sister. That's what's hindering the church. That's what's keeping the river from flowing. That unforgiving spirit, that anger, that self-pity. Amen. These things, what keep that river? Not the people murdering folks on the streets of Los Angeles. Not the people that hate us. Not the ACLU that are pointing their finger at us. That's just saying Christ must be here some measure or another. That is not what hurts us. It isn't the uh, Alexander's, the coppersmiths. Amen. It's the Ananias and Sapphira at our own altar that's stopping the flow of this river. We got to deal with the unforgiveness of our own heart. The malice, the hatred. Preachers put up with it. They're looking for retirement so they won't deal with what's out there. All kinds of things that are going on. Then wonder why the river don't flow. Amen. Engaged in light and foolish jesting, which is not convenient. All of this. Have we allowed less important things to take time and attention to the work of God should have been? That's what stopped the flow of the river. And we've got to get rid of that. We've got to do. If you have to go to your brother or sister, then you have to go. If we want to reach a world, it has to be. Has the word of God in prayer been neglected in your life? Oh, I pray, I know, about five minutes before you go to bed, you wore out, you fall down, go to sleep on him. He don't want the leftovers of your life. Man wrote a book about tithing. He said, the world's meanest thief, and they're dealing with tithe. He said, I pastor the church. All of them believed in tithing. He said, they'd come bring me their suit. They wore out nine-tenths of it. Give me the last tenth. <laughs> you know, that isn't what he wants off the top. Amen. People always come in. Do you think I ought to tithe before or after deductions? I said, you know what? I don't bother when you tithe. What bothers me is you seeing how cheap you can get into this thing. Oh, yes, sir. You want to work. I have got tithes checked, $10.04. Oh, let me tell you. It's a dark day. $10.04. Well, I'd have made it a nickel, I'll tell you that. There ain't no way. It, 
You wonder why the river isn't flowing. I mean, it's so selfish with God. We want to see how close to this world we can walk and make it in. Do you think it's wrong to do that? No, but you do. Amen. Whether I do or not, doesn't matter. You do. If you even think it's wrong, leave it alone. It better got to heaven and said, child, I wouldn't have sent you to hell for doing that little thing. But it'd be a terrible thing to get up in hell and say, if you'd listened to me, you wouldn't have been here. I'd rather get to heaven knowing that I had some liberties that I didn't use and get to hell and find some liberties I took wasn't right. It isn't how close I can walk to that world and be right. How far away from it I can get and please God. That is the attitude. Only one answer. We have to confess these evils before God, claim His promised forgiveness, believe that He meant what He said. Having sought the removal of the hindrances, yielded ourselves up in that total consecration, let us be filled with the Holy Ghost anew to occupy and govern that cleansed temple. Amen. Once you've confessed, once you've got rid of it, then allow that Holy Ghost to come and fill that cleansed temple to sanctify it. God only awaits our real consecration, not halfway. No, no, not leaving part of it outside. He wants everything on that altar because that's where the fire is going to fall. Let us stand.